Welcome back. In the second part of the lecture, we want to talk about we want to talk about services and microservices. So in general, services are very similar to components. We will see some differences and discuss those differences in this uh, following part. But we will also talk about microservices and this. Uh, as this is a, a larger hype topic and um, many software systems today are developed by means of microservices, uh, we want to talk about more about the philosophy and why is, uh, it is uh, considered a hype and also some of the drawbacks of these uh, approaches. So, and again, we will have the particular focus on how to implement features, how to implement product lines with services and microservices. So what is a service? A service is a module implemented and operated as a small yet independent system offering access to its internal logic and data through a well-defined network interface. So we're talking about services as being modules, but those modules do not communicate with a direct connection in terms of a programming language, but over a network interface. This means that these services can run on different uh, computation nodes, uh, on different hardware, for instance, uh, but they do not have to, right? So it's only that the communication works through a network interface. In the same holds for microservices, we, we will see some differences uh, in a minute between services and microservices. So what is a service architecture or microservice architecture? It is a cohesive, independent, uh, uh, process interacting via messages. A microservice architecture uh, is a distributed application where all of its modules are microservices. And uh, this explains uh, a bit. So we have another view of what is a service. Um, it's we have some independent parts uh, of our uh, software, and those communicate via messages and a microservice uh, architecture or service-oriented architecture uh, is then uh, does mean that we have several of those modules and they communicate with each other. And basically the system on the right uh, is already showing what's happening here. So we have uh, several computation nodes and the, um, the paths uh, between them, the edges between them, indicate which are communicating uh, with each other, where services are uh, exchanging data among two different services. And while this is the, the common situation, it could be even that we have a large system and all of its services can run on the very same system, but we still have some advantages of the service-oriented architecture. So what is the difference between components and services? And basically much of what we taught in the last part of the lecture is uh, does also apply to services. So what is the difference? The main difference is that if we look at components, we have inter intra process communication. So when it comes to components, we have several components, but they, they run on basically the same uh, hardware and in particular they run in the same process. So we have different processes running in an operating system and they run these different components typically run in the same process and they communicate for instance by means of method calls. Right. So you can think of the Java module system. We have two modules and each module has a certain API and the one module can call some uh, methods in the API uh, in the public uh, from the public API of the other Java module and then this uh, all happens in one computational process these components can even access um, uh, certain parts of the memory if the object and the principles allow this if this is part of the public API so this is different with services uh, so for services we have different processes. So even if they run on the same hardware, we have different processes. And whenever two processes want to exchange data, they need to exchange data, even though it's, it will be stored in the same format afterwards, they need to exchange it from one process to the other one. 
So if it's on one computer, there is still a duplication of all the data that we have to another process in most of the cases. And if we even look at another system, uh, then we need to uh, yeah, transfer data uh, in one direction or the other. And there's different protocols for this, uh, for instance, a REST API or something like this. So the main difference is that services are uh, by, uh, by definition can be easily uh, uh, put into distributed systems, but they can also run on the same node, but still they have different processes in terms of a, an operating system. As a consequence, each service can be implemented using a different technology stack, whereas components are bound to the same technology in, in with at least some limitations. In the Java world, for instance, you can say that you can implement a part of the system with Java and another one with some other language that is based on the Java ecosystem. Uh, but uh, for microservices or services, you have all the freedom in the technology stack. You can even run it on different hardware. You can have another operating system being used. You can have some other middleware being used. Um, and you can have some other configuration of all those different parts. So microservice architecture, um, in general, this is again uh, something that is related to the library scaling problem. We discussed the library scaling problem in the last part of the lecture. And this picture is about to remind you of this problem. How do we find the right scale? How do we find the right size of certain components? And of course, services also face this problem. What is the right size of the service? So, and the term microservice indicates that this service is basically smaller. We will actually see that there's more about this philosophy of microservices than simply the size. Um, but in general, uh, components are unspecific uh, of how to deal with the general requirement, not too small, but not too big, right? So we talked about uh, large components as vertical scaling with uh, which have problems and also small components uh, also have problems. So in microservice architectures, this is different because microservices uh, are driven by organizational constraint and, and agile teams and continuous delivery and not so much the modularity principles behind. So it's interesting and uh, Microservice architectures were actually not designed by some genius research my, researchers, but this is some practice, some well-known and uh, good working practice from uh, industry. People are doing this and over, over time uh, they found names for this and now it's called microservice. So if the code base is too big to be managed by a small team, looking to break it down is very sensible. The smaller the service, the more you maximize the benefits and downsides of microservice architecture. And this uh, statement is great because it's uh, actually one of the few statements that you will find from uh, uh, about eight years ago that were already claiming they're not only benefits, but also downsides, right? So most of the literature is just focusing on, and this is all, all the good stuff, and this is why you should do microservice, but in, in terms of how smaller the service will be, the, no, the more I will maximize all those benefits the literature is talking about over and over again. Uh, but also the downsides and the downsides are not so well discussed in the literature uh, are then maximized. So it's kind of a trade-off and we will look at the benefits and downsides uh, later on, uh, but basically, uh, we can adjust this and uh, if we want to have more of the benefits, then we make our microservices smaller. So, but there's more regarding uh, than just the size of the microservice. Uh, there's some philosophy uh, behind this and some principles. And one thing that is uh, very fundamental to this is Conway's law. Organizations which design system are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. And this is quite interesting because this is a statement from 19, 
68. And it's getting more popular these days um, because people found out that uh, by means of like looking at large uh, open source code uh, repositories um, like GitHub and so on. So looking at these systems, people found out that uh, found uh, much of evidence for this old, uh, very old principle uh, that there's a direct com uh, uh, combination between how you structure your teams, how your whole organization is structured, and the implementation of source code and how it's modularized. So this is interesting because it says, it tells us if you want to have a better structure, you need to have a better communication uh, organization. Right? And the interesting part about microservice is that uh, it was originally uh, yeah, driven by the fact of agile development. We want to have good working teams, so we want to optimize how the teams can work with each other and within the team and the, among the teams. And this has some consequences how to develop uh, the software then and how to modularize it. And that's where the principles and philosophies come from. There's another principle, single responsibility principle, gather together the things that change for the same reason, separate those things that change for different reasons. And this is again something from the agile movement and uh, uh, continuous development and so on. And the idea is we looked at cohesion and coupling uh, earlier and it could be fine if we have a lower, uh, a higher coupling of our classes, if it's still the case that whenever I want to do some changes, I can often do them locally. Because the changes that, uh, that, uh, that will appear uh, affecting this coupling are not so frequent, for instance. And there's another principle, you build it, you run it uh, from uh, Werner Vogel, um, which is basically uh, says that people that produce software should also run the software and then uh, kind of, uh, yeah, also make sure that it uh, evolves over time, that uh, it, it's maintained over time. And this should be the same team and not a separate team uh, of administrators. This has some consequences. So all these principles together have some consequences. Uh, so microservices are supposed to be split along business capabilities and not some technical concerns. Right? You could say that I'm splitting the system up into its user interface and into its server and uh, AI components and so on. But the thing is, we rather want to look at it from a business perspective and it's very unlikely that you will have a large a web application and all of this user interface is coming from one uh, single uh, service. But instead, this whole user interface will be provided by means of several uh, microservices or services. Each microservice is built full stack and operated by a small agile team and that takes over full responsibility. And this is DevOps and this is what is, um, yeah, uh, the principle behind this is you build it, you run it. So now we come back to the size. So what does uh, this whole philosophy and those principles do not uh, tell us much about the size yet? A microservice could be rewritten in two weeks. So this is a very strong, claim and um, but it gives us at least like a feeling uh, how large should be a microservice and of course this depends on the t the size of the team the expertise uh, it depends on the programming language for instance whether we want to rewrite it in another language or the same language um, but it at least uh, gives us a feeling uh, and uh, the size of the team is basically um, uh, given from agile principles. And one of those principles, so how long a large should be a team, every team should be small enough that can be fed with two pizzas. So these are the large ones from uh, the US. Uh, in the US, uh, we have these large pizzas and we have two of them. Uh, the team size shouldn't be larger uh, than they 
stay, they will stay hungry and uh, it's not about eating and they don't have to eat pizza every day uh, but it's a matter of team organization it's a matter of efficiency so if a team gets too large then we have too much um, uh, too much overhead communication overhead so imagine you have a table and on this table they are sitting five persons if one person is talking four are listening but this becomes more inefficient if you have the same or a larger table and 20 people are sitting on this table one person is talking and 19 people are listening then it gets much more inefficient there are traditional promises of microservices in terms of scalability. So microservices are small enough that then they can be that one uh, microservice can be developed by a small agile team. Uh, we have continuous integration and deployment. Microservices can be deployed independently of each other. So they can be developed to some extent independent of each other and can also be deployed. So we can have updates of the system, for instance. We have heterogeneity, which means each microservice can be implemented using its own technology stack. So in principle, for every microservice, we can use a different programming language. Um, we have four torrents. Uh, the crash of a single microservice in most cases should not lead to the crash of the entire system. So then only some part of the system's uh, functionality is not available. Um, unless it's a very critical um, infrastructure like an uh, authentication service, uh, as we've seen examples in the past. Efficiency, uh, configuration of the execution environment can be optimized to each microservice. And this is also when it comes to energy efficiency. So this will be um, a very important topic also in the future. So how much energy goes into certain computations, then we can try to optimize uh, the hardware, the environment, uh, all the technology stack. We can optimize the configuration to every single microservice. And then we have modernization. So microservice can be easily replaced by an alternative one, even re-implemented from scratch. At least that's the vision. And of course, this depends a bit on the size and complexity of such a microservice. So microservices are a hype topic. And uh, this is reflected in Google queries, uh, Google search queries for the term microservice. We can look in the, the upper picture and see that uh, kind of the, the term was coined somewhere. And then people started Googling and wanted to find out more about these microservices everyone is talking about. Um, and the question is, uh, when does it, uh, yeah, when is there sufficient knowledge uh, and it, it starts, uh, stops getting, uh, being a hype topic. Um, but we've seen this for other trends in the past, uh, for instance, in yellow for distributed computing. So this is, uh, of course, not the same as microservices, but uh, there are at least some analogies. Uh, we have the Internet of Things where we say, OK, uh, we have uh, everything connected. And this all uh, is another buzzword for distributed computing. Uh, we have service-oriented architecture. And it's interesting that microservices became much more popular than just service-oriented architectures. Um, and this is because it's not just an implementation technique, but it's, uh, there's a philosophy behind this, how to organize your teams, how to organize the size of a single microservice. And while these are all the traditional uh, promises of these microservices, uh, I already indicated that every of those benefits um, will also have disadvantages. And as we heard before, uh, the smaller um, the microservices, most of these uh, properties will actually, these benefits will be maximized. But at the same time, there also come uh, downsides. I want to give one example. Let's talk again about heterogeneity. So we can implement every microservice using another programming language and so on. So we are, we are completely flexible. But now what happens over time? Assume you have a large company and you have 10 
uh, agile teams and each team chooses their own favorite programming language. And now at some point in time, you find out, and this is rather frequent uh, uh, that this happens, that some part is actually a bottleneck because you're transferring a lot of data from this one microservice to another. You want to join two microservices or you want to transfer some of the functionality of one microservice to the other one. But then you basically need to implement it from scratch if it's another programming language. Also, you might need to uh, rearrange your team members because your team members are now, uh, yeah, their expertise is not needed in one of the teams anymore. So they need to be sent to another team. But sending it to another team means they need to write in a different programming language. So this heterogeneity, this flexibility comes at the price of, like, at, at least at a company level, uh, that the more heterogeneity you have, the more problems you have when transferring uh, either members or code among different of those microservices. And there are different uh, stories behind all of the benefits because each benefit can also lead to certain drawbacks. So how to implement software product lines? So this was a lot about the philosophy behind microservices about services. Uh, recap, so for component-based implementation, what we've said is that we have these components. In this case, we have developed components, which are wheels of cars. And then we want to build the car and we still have to provide some glue code uh, uh, that this works. I see the point that uh, this analogy is not working very well because if we use glue, then uh, the wheels will probably not work properly. Uh, anyway. Uh, we looked at these pictures and the question is, how does this apply to services? For services, it's a bit different. Um, the, it's uh, the basic same idea. We implement features as services instead of components and the feature selection determines which services are to be composed. But the service composition, the way how we combine different services, it's much more standardized than it is for individual components and how to provide the glue code and how to connect components among each other. So this is why the picture that we can see over here is a little more uh, tidied up uh, than the, uh, the picture that we've seen before. So there are different strategies to combine uh, those, um, those services. And we will look at the different general strategies, but still we, uh, we need to produce glue code. We still need to com combine the different uh, services, but it's a bit more standardized in the way how we can do this. And there are two principal strategies in order to compose different services. One is orchestration. The description of an executable process as a combination of service, and this is the centralized perspective and, for instance, one of the examples to apply this in practice is the web services business process execution language. And this is similar to if you look at uh, cars and traffic and how the, the traffic is organized, this is similar to traffic lights. So we have an overall system that makes sure that uh, all these different cars can operate uh, on the same streets that they um, yeah, that they can use uh, the same streets uh, uh, over here in this example. So there is a service or there might be several services that actually provide us um, the way how these other services are connected with each other, which data flows from one service to another one. And this is what is called as service orchestration. And there's service Chore choreography. Uh, each service describes its own task with a service composition. And this is a decentralized perspective. And a common example is the web service choreography description language. So this is more like uh, how um, a roundabout is working. So every car comes there. So there's no traffic light deciding who is uh, supposed to, to travel when uh, on uh, passing this uh, crossing of certain streets, but rather every part, every service is independent. Uh, there is still, in most cases, some central service where you register and say, 
here I'm available, I can provide the following data and I want to have the following data. Um, but it's not that the, uh, the services are uh, managed and organized from top in a central manner, but they are uh, decentralized. Uh, they are looking at maybe different positions uh, where they register for other services and want to uh, exchange data and run on their own. So what are the lessons learned? We looked at services and microservices. Services are another kind of module implemented and operated independently of each other. And by means of operated, we mean it's executed in a different process on an operating system. And this can be different processes on the same operating system, but this can also be um, in a uh, distributed uh, uh, network of computational nodes and we they all come with their own operating system and we execute them independently. Microservices have a clear philosophy regarding their size, mainly driven by organizational constraints. Right? So the idea is not to look for technical constraints, how to uh, split up the system, but rather organizational constraints. What What are new business uh, capabilities that come for a time that might also leave after a while, uh, we want to modelize them. We can use microservices and services uh, to have reuse within and beyond product lines. And there's still no automated product derivation. Uh, and here we do not talk about glue code, although it's a very similar principle. So we want to be Services, microservices need to communicate with each other, but this is uh, typically known as orchestration or choreography. There's further uh, related work where you can read something. And we talked about the promises of microservices. And the question is, do you see any drawbacks, right? So you might want to go back to the slide uh, where I talked about all the potential benefits and um, you uh, might want to reflect what are additional drawbacks that can occur over here. And in a component-based product line implementation, practitioners often rely on clone and own for glue code. And the question is, how can we apply the variability? How can we handle the variability means by means of service orchestration? So this is it for the second part. Uh, Glad uh, to have you here for services and microservices, and we will continue in the next part with plugins. See you then.